Welcome back to episode 2 of Clowns on the Internet where I'll be providing you some of the weekly updates on the markets movement and maybe some of the updates surrounding the two um, specific markets that we usually follow namely the United States and China and of course specifically in this video I will definitely be addressing whether we should buy the dip or not and of course none of this is financial advice please do your own due diligence and everything is for entertainment purposes only so let's just kickstart the entire discussion um, following up from episode 1 where we were actually expecting um, the Chinese GDP data to be released. And China actually reported a 8.1% GDP growth in 2021. And essentially, um, they cited that um, it was definitely helped by um, robust exports. But there are also signs that the momentum is slowing um, on weakening consumption and the property downturn. So initially, um, consensus estimates by all the analysts is that China will at least come in at around 8% GDP growth. And of course, um, they never fail to deliver. Largely speaking, I think the zero COVID strategy in China did help them retain um, the exporting powers um, because factories manage to continue functioning and um, workers continue going to work while the rest of the other countries in the world um, are still experiencing um, a lot of turmoil a lot of different um, covid variants and all the more shutting down and opening up which is extremely disruptive to all the supply chains essentially china held their cards close to their heart and they played this um, strategy out um, I won't say perfectly, but close to perfectly. So moving forward into 2022, um, Goldman Sachs actually predicted uh, 2022 growth to be 4.3%, down from their initial estimate of 4.8%. And of course, um, they cited a lot of problems like macroeconomic conditions and also this entire idea of export reversal. Because um, I would believe that most of the people in the world um, would be expecting the pandemic to die down and 2022 actually feels like a very good year um, for the pandemic to slowly, slowly fade away and to transform and transit into a normal flu. On the flip side, um, Chinese officials actually commit to a 5% GDP growth in 2022. And one thing for sure, if you want to invest in China and to look into China as a country, um, you should trust whatever the officials have to say because a lot of data, a lot of the analytics, a lot of understanding of the country really relies on the top man in the job. And if the tone from the top promises or commits to something, I'm quite sure they have the ability to deliver, um, barring any exogenous circumstances. And of course, um, to kickstart the entire year, um, just last week alone as well, China actually announced that they were cutting their one-year loan prime rate from 3.8% to 3.7% and the five-year loan prime rate from 4.65% to 4.6%. And this five-year loan prime rate is essentially the references um, for mortgages. So upon this news, um, the Chinese tech sector in Hong Kong essentially rallied up and KWEB, which is Crane Shares for the Chinese tech, actually rallied for 5, 5 to 6% on that day alone. However, not barring the weakness of the entire market, that said, um, KWEB year-to-date returns is still up 1.66% compared to NASDAQ or S&P 500. But I'd just like to say, it's nothing to be proud of because a lot of all this Chinese tech sector essentially got murdered in 2021. So um, like the low base effect, if you were to compare with a much lower reference point, um, it's easy to see why is it up, uh, despite all these different developments in the entire market by and large. So the funny thing is, when China actually reported a 8.1% GDP growth in 2021, um, the market actually didn't react um, very positively to all this news because it is kind of in line with the different expectations of the analysts. And this also means that um, China is currently on route um, to combat a lot of their problems like slow macroeconomic conditions, the property meltdown and stuff like that. So there is no need for a very quick response from the government. So essentially, um, they thought that, hey, um, let's just sell down all these equities. And I believe one or two days later, the government essentially came out with the announcement of cutting the loan prime rate, which allowed for the Chinese tech sector to rally, um, despite only for a short while. So there was this very interesting discussion in my Discord chat. Um, I'll just like to expound the discussion here a little. I actually put forth a very simple message um, in one of the chats saying that, Technically, China has been exporting inflation since the pandemic happened. They weren't as eager to keep the exchange rate low because nobody was able to substitute the supply. So with this printing ahead um, in mind, if they're able to drive back demand and have locals, um, which is the Chinese people, start competing for goods and services because of the shortage of supply, um, then it's, it will be a very interesting inflation war ahead. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about this um, because 
Um, people have not realized that actually China has been exporting deflation over the last decade or so before this pandemic happened. So what do I mean by exporting deflation? Essentially because China is an export oriented country, a lot of the growth in China is supported by their local economy. That I don't deny. So you understand that, hey, um, I think 20 to 30% of the GDP in China is supported by the property sector. And this entire property meltdown is a very grave concern to the government. That said, um, a huge part of the economy is also supported by all the different exports. And in order for you to keep your exports price competitive, um, China essentially adopted a stance of manipulating the currency. And I believe most of you know that um, ex-president, um, President Trump, essentially accused China of manipulating the currency and also making a lot of all these different exports um, provided by other countries to be less price competitive. And also, you have to understand that a lot of all these goods and services in the export industry are usually low value added goods. And essentially, this means that they are easily substitutable. And because they are easily substitutable also means that they are a lot more price sensitive um, to different consumers. So in order to maintain the price competitiveness of China exports, what um, China essentially do is to manipulate the currency and to keep it low. So if I were to just input the exchange rate graph between um, renminbi and USD, you can see that before the pandemic, um, USD and renminbi, renminbi has essentially been constantly depreciating to around seven, seven odd dollars um, to one dollar USD. And after the pandemic, um, China essentially exploited their position. They know that nobody is able to provide the substitute. Nobody is able to plug the demand that the entire world has. So what they do is, um, usually if you were to look all the way back to, I think, early 2000s, um, renminbi and USD actually trades in a band. And this band has been slowly widening. And widened in a way where it allows a lot more flexibility um, for essentially the Chinese officials or the Chinese government to manipulate. And in this case, you can see that um, over just the last two years since 2020, after the pandemic um, hit all of us by a storm, you can see that China's renminbi has essentially been appreciating. And by appreciating, um, this is definitely hurting um, all the different export-oriented companies because they have to export out. And if the local currency they are trading your goods and services in is constantly appreciating, from the foreigner's point of view, whether it's Singapore, US, buying stuff from China, um, it definitely looks a lot more expensive. So in this case, you have to look at the last one and a half years to two years, China transited from exporting deflation because they have to keep their goods cheap to currently exporting inflation. And of course, um, with all the supply chain constraints and um, uh, picked up demand and also um, a decrease in supply, all these different S curves essentially hit each other. And that's why you are seeing this entire um, peak inflation performance. Um, I don't really know whether we have hit the peak or not, but you can see that it's gaining a momentum in terms of why um, nothing is dying down even though the world is opening up and inflation continues to rise. So the most worrying part of this trend is that given the current easing of monetary policy stance from the Chinese government, um, they're essentially trying to drive demand and, and more importantly local demand. And especially also um, with their new dual circulation strategy. And I did dissect that particular strategy in my previous video in episode one. So please feel free to go back. Um, they might essentially export even more inflation outwards. Of course, contingent on the fact that um, their policy is effective in the first place. So this is just my general understanding of the dynamic relationship between the US and China um, today. Now, to go into the banking and tax sector trend, um, because of course last week they all hit us by a storm and a lot of people blame um, the tech sector which is Netflix and of course um, the banking sector for posting um, less than spectacular results which affected a lot of um, our own um, optimism and expectations moving forward. So firstly to discuss about the banking sector, I think Goldman Sachs shares actually dropped 7% after their earnings miss. So quarterly profits fell 13% um, from a year earlier because um, they cited increased employees costs and it jumped by 23% in the quarter. So the, the main, of course, the main culprit, they say that, oh, they have to retain talents. And because you understand there's this great resignation problem going on, people are um, reflecting upon their life. They, they realize that their work has no meaning and then they have to reevaluate um, their life purpose and life goals again. And of course, because of this booming creator's economy, everybody's intending to become a YouTuber. That's why um, it's very hard to retain talent. And more importantly, um, the finance industry is an extremely cutthroat industry. So in order to retain talents in your specific company, they inevitably have to um, compensate their workers on 
on a hard, much higher quantum and a much higher tier. If not, they'll start jumping over to JP Morgan or Bank of America. Anyway, whether this increased employee cost is justified or not really depends on the output. If the output of all these so-called talents or employees are kept constant, yet at the same time they constantly jack up on the employees' costs and the compensation packages, then on the net, I don't think that it's um, beneficial to the economy by and large. If it's solely just because they want to retain talents, then I'm not really sure whether is it an effective mechanism. And more importantly, um, this ballooning of the compensation package might not be sustainable. Next, going on to big tech, um, it's the start of the season again, where a lot of all these big tech companies will start reporting their earnings. So Netflix was the first of its pack, and they actually posted decent results, um, but they still crashed a good 20-25% because they provided a disastrous guidance. So analysts actually predicted um, 5.8 million net ads um, in quarter one, but they actually provided a forward guidance of 2.5 million. So this is one of the most um, disastrous miss in terms of how the analyst expects for Netflix to provide and attract even more customers in the coming quarters. And this miss was more than 50%. So this really provided a new perspective to a lot of all these different analysts on, on Wall Street or even retail investors to reconsider their position. And because like Netflix, um, a lot of the growth companies have crazy assumptions. And a lot of the popular companies in 2021 were mostly growth companies. Most of them might be making a loss, but um, they are posting great and phenomenal amount of growth rates, at least in the last two years. Now, um, Netflix is essentially like a primer, and it's essentially a wake-up call to a lot of people who baked in huge amount of growth assumptions in their model and say that, oh, um, this company, X company is able to grow 30, 40, 50% in the next three to five years. And then when they look at Netflix as a classic example, oh, I thought they were able to grow at 5.8 million. Now they're te providing me with a guidance of 2.5 million only. Maybe I have to revisit my model again and to relook on the growth assumptions that I baked into my own uh, model. So that's essentially the underlying outlook and what people have been thinking about at least for the last week or so. And of course, um, this is my own expectation and my own assumption. And in the coming week or so, we have great companies reporting their earnings as well. Companies like Microsoft, Tesla, Intel, Apple, Visa, Mastercard. And also, um, you might want to take a look at all these different defensive companies in the defense sector. Um, Lockheed Martin, 3M, J&J, Caterpillar. I think all these are your so-called um, very lane, very boomer company. They also do make up a significant enough portion of S&P 500 and they do reflect um, the underlying economy's health as well. So it's also a good thing to take note of some of their headline numbers and don't just focus on the big tech sector because they're all nice and sexy. So on top of that, I'm referencing from some of the bigger creators out there like Jeremy from Financial Education and Mick Kevin. They're currently discussing about this theory or this idea that, hey, if you were to look at our own YouTube analytics, you can see that there is a significant drop in revenue. And because YouTube is a revenue sharing platform, um, they essentially take a 45% cut from the creator's um, um, advertisement rates. You can see that um, usually in December, a lot of companies want to expense the entire uh, marketing budget for the year. So um, December ad rates tend to be a little bit higher and then moving into January, it will start reverting back to the mean. However, the usual reversion of the mean only takes up probably around 15 to 20% max. But if I were to share my own data to you, I am currently experiencing a 30 to 50% drawback if I were to compare the two months data. And in this case, it might be a little bit worrisome, especially when Netflix um, provided such a disastrous guidance. And as you all understand, YouTube is part of Google and Alphabet, which is the parent company. So it might be a market-wide or even an industry-wide thing where moving into 2022, they might provide less than spectacular or less than stellar guidance results. And because of this new guidance, um, different analysts or even different investors might have to reevaluate um, the proposition and to reevaluate a lot of the investments um, moving forward. So this would essentially crash the market. And of course, Amit Kevin released a new video on why he essentially liquidated his 20 million portfolio. You can take a look. I'll leave the link. I'll leave the um, thumbnail somewhere there. Um, to me, I'm a long-term investor. I'm the real long-term investor. If I say that I have a five-year horizon, I really do have a five-year horizon. I'm not trying to time in and time out of the market, so it doesn't really affect me. And of course, because I don't really have any big tech exposure, I probably only have like a few shares of Facebook. Um, if it continues dipping, I'll probably continue buying, but it's not substantial to my entire portfolio, so I don't really care. However, um, it might be good information for those of you who wants to buy the dip or for those of you who have great exposure in tech, um, whether you want what, what you want to do is entirely up to you. Um, but I'll just like to caution you that if you're really in it for the long term and long haul, 
Um, whatever mid Kevin is doing is quite dangerous because if you are trying to time the market, you have to be right twice. Once, you have to sell at the right timing and on the second time, you have to time the entry again before tech starts recovering and before money starts rotating in again. So with that in mind, if you're not a day trader, if, if you don't really care about it, then all this information is quite useless to you. But I think some of you ought to know um, you shouldn't be constantly trying to time the market because it is an extremely dangerous endeavor. So now coming to the last part of this video and essentially the headline topic of this um, video specifically. We understand that growth stock has been experiencing huge amount of turmoil over the last two or three weeks. 2022 is not forgiving for a lot of all the growth stocks. And a lot of you who have growth stocks on your watch list will constantly have one question in mind. Is it a good time to start entering into a position? Is it a good time um, to start buying the dip? Personally, I do have growth stocks in my watch list, um, but a lot of all these quote unquote so-called growth stocks are also in the e-commerce industry. I usually take them as a litmus test to understand how the e-commerce industry is doing by and large and I don't really intend to take a position in them. However, if this downtrend persists, um, I don't mind looking into some of the companies that I prefer and I'll definitely be doing follow-up videos if you guys are interested. But that said, um, there's a reason why I probably have close to zero exposure in all these different quote-unquote um, popular retail stocks in the market um, in 2021. And of course, um, going all in into Alibaba does not help. But that said, I would like to reference it to what happened um, in 2021 to all the different Chinese equities. So back in 2021, we know that um, the Chinese government is cracking down on all these different big tech companies. Um, it's a knife dangling on all the investors' head. Um, Alibaba went from 310 all the way to 200 to 180 to 160. Tencent also went from 600 to 500 to 400. The problem is we don't really know when is the bottom. And a lot of people are laughing at um, Alibaba back holders saying that why are you catching the falling knife? Exit your position, you dummy. I think we can draw many parallels um, to what's happening today. We know that the Fed is intending to increase interest rate. We know that the Fed is intending to stop their bond purchases. We know that they intend to retire um, the balance sheet. But we don't know when. So the biggest problem now is if you are buying into good companies with a reasonable valuation, with a huge margin of safety, I don't think you have to worry about anything. Many things are known facts in the market and people attempt to price in a lot of things. And in today's US market, um, I'll just post a graph somewhere here. Interest rate consensus feels like um, they are pricing in four rate hikes in 2022. So this entire drawdown feels like the market is trying to front run what's going to come. And of course, whenever there's uncertainty, there'll be volatility. And what happened to the Chinese equities in 2021 is a classic example. Nobody knew what the hell um, the Chinese government was thinking, or so they thought. Nobody knew whether is this a political agenda, whether is this really doing it for the good of the people. And a lot of all these crackdowns that they did um, all came together at once. Um, you look at the education industry, you look at the crackdown on property, and then you look at all this big tech getting fined left, right, and center. As an investor, inevitably you'll feel extremely jittery and then you'll start selling out because you don't know what the heck is happening. So um, you sell first and then you think later. But for the contrarian people um, like me, for those of you who dare to have balls of steel and think that, oh, um, Chairman C is doing it for the good of the people, for the good of the economy, and then you see that, hey, it's trading at a very attractive valuation, and you think that um, the Chinese tech sector is bound for a rebound, then sure, carry on, go ahead and continue buying in. Um, if you're to lose everything in mind um, because you went all in, then take it as a lesson and, and just man up and move on. But the problem now is there is a huge amount of uncertainty. And for those of you who are interested in adding positions, I will probably hold it out um, until the 26th of January Wednesday meeting. And then Jerome Powell will probably give us a more clearer guidance. Prior to that, um, for those of you day trading, um, doing using your technical charts and whatnot, please go ahead, I'm not stopping you. But for those of you who really want to invest for the long term, please just follow my four step process. Circle of competence, margin of safety, intellectual integrity, and just have patience. Just disregard the fact that um, whether is it a falling knife or not. If you have the conviction and the income, um, please feel free to continue building a position. If you don't have the conviction, maybe you should start doing some homework. I think it's a good time to start doing your research and to understand the companies in your portfolio on a much deeper level. And I think in the last part, um, in every single market cycle, um, there are opportunities everywhere. 
Um, don't just be too fixated in some of the industries or maybe in some type of companies with a specific characteristic. I think it's good to expand your strategy and don't be too obsessed about, oh, um, if the company don't grow at least 40%, I'm not looking into it because it's a dying company. I really don't understand that train of thought. Uh, but of course, this is a free market. Please feel free to do whatever you want to. And just to end off this entire video, um, I saw this um, very interesting example um, on the online space, whether it's on Reddit or even on YouTube. Some of them are suggesting that, hey, um, if you look at all the growth stocks, some of them actually fell 50% from their all-time high. Um, the worst even went down 75% or 80% from its all-time high. So it feels like a spring being compressed. And then when the time is right, um, it will essentially spring up and just bounce up um, back to its real intrinsic value. That said, I have no qualms um, surrounding the example. But the most important and underlying factor that you have to look into is, is that spring really functioning or not? Are you buying a fundamentally good company? If it's a faulty spring, um, I don't care how compressed it is, um, the spring will never bounce back because it's a trash company that you're buying into. With that, I'll see you in the next video, but more importantly, I'll see you on the moon. Goodbye!